I'm going to be talking to Alex Petonia who, about green hydrogen the electrolyzers, and he's a research fellow in commercial hydrogen development at the Energy Transition Research Institute of the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. We've reached him in Poland, so welcome to the interview, Alex. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. Let's start with the basics. How do green hydrogen electrolyzers work? Well, uh, they just, uh, in principle, they were work in a very simple way. They split water into oxygen and hydrogen. The technicalities uh, become more difficult when it comes to specific technologies. So in principle, they just split water into oxygen and hydrogen. And what kind of, I, I, I looked at your study and there are actually a lot more electrolyzers, types of electrolyzers than I uh, imagined. So what are the main types of electrolyzers? Uh, well, we looked at most of the currently considered technologies, but we focused on the four main types that are currently being, uh, that are currently believed to be uh, applicable to the green uh, net zero future. So we look at alkaline electrolyzers, PEM electrolyzers, AEM electrolyzers, and solid exceed electrolyzers. They are quite different in terms of how they work, but they are all uh, very much relevant to what we are discussing in terms of um, transition into a better future. Now, so, are, um, are, are all of them, you know, at the same stage of development? Like I've, I've, I've read that um, electrolyzers are probably around, oh, maybe at, by 2030, uh, they'll be able to produce hydrogen at the same, you know, a competitive price to blue hydrogen, which is made from natural gas. And they're about two to three times more expensive now. So are they all at the same stage of development or at the different stages? And unfortunately not, they're, they're not at the same stage of development. Elec electrolyzers are not really new, but none of them are really uh, old. So alkaline electrolyzers have been around for over a century or around a century. So they've been used for a long time and they we know what it is. And uh, unfortunately, those electrolyzers are not very much compatible with the intermittent renewables. And by saying intermittent, I mean wind and solar, uh, first and foremost, because you cannot really produce electricity using sun 24 hours a day, unless you live in the Arctic and, and that then you will face the Arctic winter when you won't have any sunlight, right? So um, alkaline electrolyzers are not very suitable for that. PAM electrolyzers, uh, that's the next uh, technology that has already been co commercialized. It's more suitable for that. The remaining two technologies, that basically aim to you know, get rid of the drawbacks of the first two types of technologies are uh, AEM electrolyzers and solid, electro solid exceed electrolyzers. They have not been commercialized yet. Okay, so uh, what are the key cost drivers for the different electrolyzers? Uh, well, I should probably first start with the key cost drivers of green hydrogen just to mention that the cost of electrolyzers is not the key cost driver for green hydrogen. The key cost driver for green hydrogen is the cost of electricity, renewable electricity in this case. So right now, for instance, with the energy crisis in Europe and also with the war going on in Ukraine and the high cost of fossil fuels, we are observing situations when green hydrogen has become relatively compatible with, uh, with fossil fuel-based hydrogen. So right now, that's obviously an exception, but uh, if we we're talking about electrolyzers, the key cost drivers would be the cost of stack. That's basically the machinery that produces uh, hydrogen. That would be power electronics, uh, gas conditioning and balance of plant, but the cost of stack is the most important part. And how do you get those prices, uh, those costs down? Is it further development of the technology? Is it scaling up the manufacturing? What is it? That's a great question. That's not that simple because different technologies uh, basically using different uh, types of uh, you know, uh, processes to produce hydrogen. For PEM electrolyzers, for instance, in solid exit electrolyzers, they are using platinum-based metals. And that means that really hard to uh, replace with something cheaper. That's why the, their cost is really super high. That's why obviously technological progress would make them uh, cheaper in the future, but that's not just about technology and creating that you know, atmosphere or creating that environment for innovation and uh, development. There's also more, much more about uh, creating the infrastructure for development and delivering hydrogen. 
For instance, if you produce enough hydrogen, but there's no one to buy it, there's no hydrogen market. There's no point for producing it, right? If there's no infrastructure to deliver it to the ultimate customer, what's the point of producing it? So it's not just about electrolysis or about you know, uh, producing enough stuff. That's also about buying it and hydrogen being really you know, something that um, is traded. Okay, so let's. It sounds to me like there's the uh, the production of hydrogen, there's a transportation of hydrogen, and then there's the end use of hydrogen. And and so uh, we're talking about electrolyzers, only one one of the three. But what about those other two? I mean, are, uh, your, Europe, for instance, has a very aggressive green hydrogen strategy. Uh, are they going to be putting you know public uh, investment into pipelines and, and other transportation infrastructure? Are they putting, what are they doing for, uh, to develop the, the markets? Uh, that's a great question. I think the EU, as far as I know, they, has, they have uh, been working in, in basically every single area related to that. And they have set extremely ambitious goals when it comes to green hydrogen. They want to you know, have uh, the capacity of 10 mega, uh, gigawatt of electrolyzers by 2030. So basically in less than 10 years. And they're going to supposedly be producing more than 10 uh, million tons of uh, green hydrogen per year. But the question is, would it really be you know, manageable? Uh, do we really need that much hydrogen to be produced? For instance, if you produce hydrogen and you basically generate renewable electricity to produce hydrogen, you might not have enough renewable electricity to power something that does not really need hydrogen. For, for instance, electric vehicles could have been charged, right? Instead of that kind of hydrogen that could have been produced um, using something else, right? So it's a very complex issue. And I wouldn't just, you know, specifically uh, focus on, on, on just hydrogen. I think hydrogen should be viewed as one of the elements in a greater um, decarbonization picture. So to use your, as an example, Alex, I mean, I've, off, I've off wondered this myself, you know, uh, it takes electricity and, and so you're gonna lose some of that, the efficiency, uh, you're gonna lose some of that electricity that you use in the electrolyzer through inefficiencies. And where, where would be the, the advantage uh, if you just use the electricity itself to power, you know, your heat pumps or your electric vehicles or your electric arc furnaces or, or whatever it is. Now, I understand, because we see this in Canada, there's a discussion about using hydrogen as a means of storing energy for when, you know, the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. In, in Western Canada, it's in salt caverns and there's other means of storing it. So is that kind of what might drive this, is that hydrogen becomes a, a storage medium for uh, intermittent uh, renewables? I think there are a little bit more aspects to hydrogen than just that. You can obviously consider hydrogen for uh, powering something that would not really be most efficiently powered by electricity. For instance, uh, vehicles working in harsh conditions of the Canadian Arctic might not necessarily be very much suitable for being powered with electricity. At least uh, some research sh pieces show that electricity might, you know, electric vehicles, owners of electric vehicles often complain that they are pretty much cold you know in, in winter conditions in winter conditions they're not necessarily the best vehicles to drive obviously with the the technology progress that might change but uh, hydrogen is a, obviously uh, one of the means to store electricity and convert electricity into something transportable we can also think about ammonia for instance because hydrogen is not super easy to be preserved and kept and then delivered because of its chemical and physical qualities. So we might need to convert hydrogen into ammonia and then deliver it overseas, for instance. So hydrogen is a great uh, sort of concept, but there are so many obstacles on the way to, to get to that you know, holy grail of green hydrogen uh, transforming our entire economy. So there are too many details that need to be you know, considered before we get there. Well, let's get back to the, the, the electrolyzers part of this. Um, how, how is this technology being developed? I mean, and obviously there are companies that are doing research and development. I mean, how, how much effort is being put into making these electrolyzers uh, efficient enough and the, the product low enough cost that it can compete with fossil fuel-based hydrogen? 
Well, it, I think it uh, should be viewed on a case by case basis or country by country basis. Some countries are more, or some companies are more enthusiastic about that, whereas some other com other companies are not that much enthusiastic. I would say that, for instance, with in the case of PAM electrolyzers, so polymer electrolyte membrane electrolyzers, uh, that's the the technology I mentioned second to after after alkaline electrolyzers. That technology has been in place for around 60 years, and that was invented or developed specifically for the US uh, space program. So even though it has been in place for over half a century, it has not really reached the scale, uh, you know, specifically for the purposes of uh, producing hydrogen in the quantities that are needed, that would be needed to, you know, around the world to create a hydrogen market. So obviously a lot more effort is currently being put into developing alkaline electrolyzers and PEM electrolyzers because those two technologies have already been commercialized. But companies or breakthrough you know, research institutes and think tanks are very much concerned about the disadvantages of those two technologies and they are putting much more effort into developing something new that would be a better match for combining hydrogen production with the renewable power generation. Because as mentioned, those two technologies are not super uh, compatible with with uh, renewable power. Yeah, are, are we going to see uh, electrolyzers, uh, the technology, follow the same path as wind and solar? The same kind of decline in the cost curve? I think uh, we all very much hope so, but there's no, you know, in history there's no ifs, right? Perhaps. We could obviously say perhaps in most probably they would follow similar uh, learning curves because learning by doing is one of the processes or one of the concepts we have uh, discussed in our paper and uh, the more you produce the more skilled you get in producing electrolyzers right but who knows as, as mentioned uh, PAM technology has been around six, ni since 90s 1960s as far as I remember and alkaline electrolyzers have been in place for over a century, but they are still not very much suitable for being coupled with intermediate for new humans. So hopefully we will see, you know, the cost of those types of electrolyzers dramatically going down, but there's so many, so many variables to that. So I'm not the one to predict. Uh, predictions are always hard if they're made about the future, you know, someone said that. Right, uh, Alex, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and uh, have a nice day then.